welcome to today's devotion. We are in Luke chapter 4, looking at the temptations of, of uh, Jesus as he came out of his baptism and was brought into the wilderness by the leading of the Holy Spirit. We're going to take a look today uh, at the last temptation, which is verse 9, and uh, go from there. So let's pray and get into the word. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your faithfulness for when we are not faithful, you are. When we are unable to live up to the level of trait, uh, trust and faith and hope that we'd like to have, you are faithful regardless. That's how good you are. So we can rest and find our rest in your faithfulness, not in ours, in your righteousness, not in ours, and in your hope. For your spirit dwells within us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There are three temptations that were given to Jesus. We covered the first two. We're going to look at the third today. This is verse 9 of chapter 4. So the devil took him to Jerusalem, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you, and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, do not test the Lord your God. After the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. Now, this is a very interesting um, temptation. It's the third one. The temptation start in, in chapter four starts with the Holy Spirit leading him into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was hungry. Immediately, you begin to see the spiritual clash of the kingdoms. So in the, in the baptism part of Jesus' life, and remember, baptism was a ritual that was in play before Jesus. It didn't just come on the scene with Jesus. It was in play, especially during the time of Jesus with a community called the Essenes. And it, 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 it meant, it signified, it was a ritual that meant a complete and total dedication and so when someone was baptized, you know, many times when we practice baptism, depending on your tradition, you pour water over someone's head. And really the form isn't all that imperative. But in its original form, one went into the water and was completely immersed and then came out because the vow was a complete vow. It wasn't a partial vow. It, it, it included all of who that person was. So when they came out of the water, the vow was such that whatever they vowed to was a complete vow of their entire being. This is why baptism is so important. One cannot dedicate themselves, if you will, or make a vow to follow Jesus, to, to pursue the kingdom on a part-time basis. It's a full-time endeavor. That doesn't mean that we don't tend to the things of the world. I don't mean that. I mean the intention and the commitment and the faithfulness and the pursuit is a 24-7 experience. So when Jesus comes out of the water and the voice, the same voice that told David that his son was to be Jedediah, meaning the one I love, the voice says to Jesus, you are my beloved son. I'm in, in other words, I'm anointing you and I am well pleased with you. And after that, the spirit then leads him. He's full of the spirit. The spirit leads him into the desert to engage head on with the enemy. To engage head on with the age old nemesis and enemy of God and of God's human family, the author of rebellion, the one who Jesus says has been a murderer from the beginning and a liar and the father of lies. He is engaging head on. 
and he doesn't eat for 40 days because he goes into a fast. Now, suffice it to say, fasting is something we, we don't practice that much, if ever. But it's a powerful spiritual tool because we spend the vast amount of time in our lives during the day and so forth, thinking about what we're going to eat, when we're going to eat, what we're going to eat, et cetera, et cetera. And when you fast, what you're doing is you're breaking habits of the body that the body will fight against, that the body in its stubbornness will, will try to, um, maneuver around to get its own way. And really fasting is a way of becoming, it's a spiritual practice that helps one become aware of the nature of their body and the way in which the body can serve the spirit, not vice versa. Very few times, well, in my experience, never actually, does someone go into a fast without some kind of, first of all, spiritual prompting and spiritual leading, but also with an intention of increased spiritual discipleship? In other words, if you're going to fast, you will probably increase the time that you spend in prayer. You will probably increase the time that you spend in solitude with the Lord. And hopefully you will increase the time that you spend in his word. And you can watch how the body will fight against that. Nonetheless, he goes into the desert and after 40 days of this transformational fast, when he is at his physical weakest, we talked about how the enemy comes when we are most susceptible. The devil tries to plant seeds of doubt and rebellion. When we get to the third uh, temptation, the devil actually takes him to Jerusalem. Now, whether he took him there in the spirit or took him there physically, my, this is just my, my take. I believe that the devil took him there in spirit. And what do I mean by that? The devil can take you anywhere in spirit if you allow him to. In other words, if there's something that comes into your life, the devil will present the most disaster, and it's a crisis, let's say, the devil will present the most disastrous outcome there is and plant that, that outcome, that idea, that thought in your head and lead you with that thought to, in, to, to almost keep you in bondage to that thought. We call that worry. We call that anxiety. Fear is the energy behind it, the physical, but the worry and the anxiety are always attached to a thought. You can be afraid without necessarily having it attached to a thought, but you can't be worried or anxious without it being attached to a thought. And so in this case, I believe that the devil took him in the spirit and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, a place that he was familiar with and that Jesus allowed it. No one forced him. He's engaging the enemy, but it's the same temptation that he gives the first two. If you are the son of God, the important thing that's going to play out in Jesus life is that that very question will be placed to Jesus in an accusatory manner when he's on the cross just outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the battleground. And in presenting that temptation, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. See that the if comes in again. And the if is always presented when someone is insecure, because if you know that you're the son of God without any doubt, 
the if is not going to have any place to, 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 to plant itself in your head. You simply know. But Jesus being, well, after 40 days without eating, susceptible, because we're always susceptible to, to, we call them negative thoughts. We're more susceptible to the enemy's thoughts when we are physically depleted. Which is why fasting is a very good exercise, a very good practice to put in, to, to, to play, a discipline to put into play. Because it teaches you how to not freak out. And it teaches you how to stay aware and vigilant when your body isn't. And so in the, in the devil bringing Jesus to this situation where he's at the temple, now the devil actually quotes scripture. And in so doing, it's a double whammy because the temptation that the devil gives to Jesus comes by way of perverting the scriptures. Of course, Jesus responds with the scripture. It is said, do not test the Lord, your God. And this is so key because if (laughs) in many ways, the devil knows the scriptures many times more than we do. And there are times where the scriptures he will use are intended by him to be used to throw us off course and to get us to listen to his voice and to listen to a deceitful perversion of the scriptures in order to bind us and, and, and to have us entertain rebellion. This is why, and this happens particularly in this world where you're wanting to do good things and the devil will present an, uh, a situation and it looks good. It, 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 the situation is, looks, I should say, obvious that what you should do is a good thing. But unless you check with God, what might appear to be an obvious act of goodness may not be an act of goodness. I guess the most common exp, uh, experience that we have in our current culture would be called enabling. For example, if somebody is on drugs and they need money and they're hurting, they don't have They haven't had anything to eat in a while. And what do you do? You give them money. You're enabling them. It looks like you're doing a good thing, but you're not. And so the key to this is not just to know God's word. That is very important. It's imperative. But to seek his spirit in revealing the truth of his word. So you get to know his voice. His voice and his word together. Are 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 tool, not tools. They are realities, and the only reality that can go against the enemy. And when you get to that level of temptation, where the enemy is using the word against you, you're getting pretty far along the road of discipleship, because now he's throwing out the word, and he's got to get more clever. Well, after all is said and done. He departs from Jesus for a time, but Jesus is never, never in the next three and a half years um, in a place where the devil is not close by, observing, waiting to not just lead him into more, more temptation, but to attack him, to kill him, to throw him off kilter in the same way that the enemy does to us. And then immediately after he departs from him, He returns to Galilee in the power of the spirit. So he's full of this. He's, he's full of the Holy spirit, meaning he's completely consumed by the spirit. And now through the temptation, he's empowered. We're going to talk about what does that mean to be empowered by the spirit? Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope that today's devotion was meaningful to you and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.